Uh, my name is Giuseppe Capalupo. Uh, I live in South Hills in Jefferson Borough, uh, right in between Clareton and Jefferson to be precise. Um, I currently sing and play a lead guitar for uh, Gypsy and his Band of Ghosts, which is a folk Americana project, and I drum for a metal band from the Robinson area called Once Nothing. I was roughly around the, the age of nine, and my aunt's house over in Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, I think it's the town, just right over the river. Uh, they had a little keyboard there, and I had this really, really weird ability at a young age to be able to hear a melody on the radio, and then transpose that to a keyboard, even if it's just like a simple like three or four note melody. But it, I started doing that at a super young age, and my parents were like, maybe we should get him a keyboard, and maybe we should get him piano lessons, and see what shakes loose. So I did classical piano lessons for. Uh, about four years and it got boring because I just got sick of playing sheet music and I wanted to write my own songs and improvise and do that kind of thing and I never really got uh, became super proficient at piano I mean I, I got a lot better than I was at nine years old but that was kind of like the foundation that uh, I, I laid for a future musical career we'll call it and um, not too shortly after that uh, my parents bought my older brother Vince a drum set and he never touched the thing. I mean, he'd, he'd practice every once in a while, but as soon as I saw that thing on Christmas morning in the basement, my eyes lit up and I'm like, what is this thing? I need this in my life. And I was just so mesmerized by it. Just I, everything about it, you know, I, I'd hear beats on the radio. I'm just like, man, what, how do I, you know, how do I get my drums to sound like that? And I just started nitpicking every little thing about it. So finally, my parents let me take drum lessons. My older brother gave me his little practice pad to practice on. And uh, I would always steal his practice time on the, the drum set my parents got years ago. And then uh, just started playing. I, I think the first official band I played for, I think I was in um, seventh grade. It was me and my buddy, Nick Honard. And we were just playing. I was playing drums. He was playing guitar. And we covered uh, Semi Charm Life by Third Eye Blind for uh, the... Uh, um, high school talent show, and uh, that was that was kind of the thing that kickstarted, you know, just being on stage, being in front of those people, you know, just an exhilarating experience at such a young age. You know, you get addicted. It's just like getting tattoos. You get one, you can't stop. You got to keep going until your body's covered up. Um, so that that transposed into me, uh, you know, joining the middle school band and. Going to high school, doing the drumline thing, playing with a couple more bands, you know, playing guitar for a screamo band called Renfield uh, in my early high school days, and then drumming for a metal band called Demise of Eros. And then after Demise of Eros, joining Once Nothing, fresh after high school, toured the country with those guys for a good while until about 2008. We put out a record with Solid State Records, did a bunch of national tours with a lot of, a lot of my favorite bands. Uh, got a couple endorsements through that. And then after we broke up, uh, a band called Haste the Day picked me up, and that's when I started to take uh, metal on the international circuit. And I got full sponsorships from Promark, Zildjian, uh, Mullins Custom Drums, Evans Heads. I got signature Promark drumsticks, and I got retainers and everything, so they still send me free stuff. And after that whole thing disbanded, I'd been writing folk songs and stuff along the way. Um, during my travels, just stories about what life is like on the road, you know, all the stuff that I was going through and experiences, good and bad. And when I came home, my buddy Caleb Pajor, I uh, was having his CD release party, and he's always been a respected friend and fellow uh, songwriter of mine. I loved all the stuff he came out with. And all of our little friends from our little clique here in Pittsburgh have always ended up playing with him because he would bring in all of our friends that are uh, other musicians to back his project whenever they're playing live shows. And he was having his big CD release party on this record that he'd been working on for well over a year. And I sent him a couple of my little bedroom demos that I just recorded with a little computer mic on my uh, laptop of all the stuff that I record on the road. The name, the reason the name Gypsy and his band of ghosts became a thing was because all the guys in haste started calling me Gypsy. You know, a lot of my friends just kind of started catching on to that because I was always on tour. And I called it Gypsy and his band of ghosts because when I was making the original demos for the original songs, it was just me recording the main vocals, the guitars, and then layering everything else over top of it myself. So it was me with a band of four other Giuseppes, uh, more or less. And then when Caleb got a hold of the stuff and he had the Cedar release party coming up, he thought to himself, well, you know, you'd be a really great fit for the project, uh, for the show tonight. 
if you know you can put put together a backing band to uh, give your songs a little more energy then he said i'd love you to love to have you so i got diego who's fronting ruckus brothers i got scott maniglia one of my best friends on drums and my buddy tony tortell on bass and we played that one show that night and everyone was everybody was like dude you guys sound like you've been playing together for years you know why would you ever want to stop you guys should play more shows play more shows and we all looked at each other we're like heck yeah man this is a blast we get to actually play music in a genre none of us had touched before and with a front man who's never been a front man before so it's like a big learning experience for everybody and it's been a lot of fun i got to know diego uh right around 2005 uh right around the middle of 2005 um he was coming to pittsburgh he was still up at uh indiana university of pennsylvania and he was close friends with one of my roommates when I was living out in Robinson with the Boys Who Wants Nothing. And he was coming to town to record some of his solo acoustic stuff. And I came home from work or rehearsal or wherever I was to our, our place in Robinson. And he was just hanging out on the couch playing these super intricate songs on his acoustic. And I'm just thinking to myself, damn, this kid can really play guitar. And then he started singing. And I'm like, man, the kid can sing too. I was like, his songs are awesome. So me and him just got to become acquaintances through that, through a mutual friend. I ended up writing a song with him that night. And then uh, like a day or two later, I actually went to the studio with him in Oakland to uh, record this instrumental song that he was putting on one of his records. And um, years went by, you know, we kept, we tried to keep in contact while I was on tour, but there was about a three, four year period where I didn't see him until uh, my touring career, at least for the meantime, had come to an end after Haste of the Day and I was coming back to Pittsburgh to stay in Pittsburgh for a while and I knew that he was um singing with Spontaneo and we had the show coming up so I got in touch with him you know we'd always been those mutual friends I was like you know maybe he would like to play on this gypsy project just for a night you know uh, fell in be a uh, session musician for a night called him up and he was stoked so we in his basement uh when he was living in that house in friendship we'd get we'd get together once every other week you know, work on all these harmonies, work on all the guitar parts, and I more or less had them rewrite backing parts to all the songs that I had the initial skeletal uh, references for. And the stuff that that kid could do on guitar and like the harmonies that he brought to the table, I was like, dude, this kid is just killing it. He just became a very, very valuable asset and a good dude, very organized, you know, just very straightforward and to the point, you know. And <laughs> I heard of... Uh, I heard of Ruckus Brothers last year whenever they did the Magical Mystery Tour. My buddy Matt, uh, Matt Gray drummed on that project. And I was just like, you know, this is such an awesome concept, you know. So whenever I got the invite to be a part of this year's show, I was just stoked. I was like, heck yeah, I love MJ. And heck yeah, I was born to play drums. Let's do this thing. I really like... Now that I've like played through the whole album of Thriller so many dang times, it's really tough. You know, because I wasn't really super, super familiar with the discography of his until, you know, I got the invite for this concert. And then I really started delving into it a little bit. But I will say Alien Ant Farm did a pretty killer cover of, uh, uh what was that song called? What? <laughs> Smooth Criminal. Yeah, Smooth Criminal. Yeah, you know, ding a ding a ding a ding a ding Yeah. And whenever I heard that, on the, I heard that on the radio. I'm like, what the heck is this? This is groovy. And that band Alien Ant Farm ripped, man. They were great. For a brief period of time. So, you know, listen to the original song. I'm like, yeah, this is this is super sick. And then I started getting more into, like, the sample-heavy kind of stuff. You know, when I started working with a little more software and hardware, like Ableton and stuff like that, I started realizing a lot of these artists are sampling all these old bands like that. So I started listening to them more. So uh, to really answer your question, I'll have to just say off a of Thriller, probably my favorite song is uh, Lady in My Life and PYT. I mean, let's be real. You can't hear the song PYT without just wanting to like immediately flash dance, like wherever the heck you are. You know, as soon as you hear that chorus, I want to love you, you just immediately have to groove. It's so good. Schizophrenic? <laughs> Schizophrenic for sure. I mean, studied jazz, drumming, played piano, played screamo guitar, drummed from metalcore and hardcore bands. Now I'm singing and playing folk Americana, and now I'm drumming 
one of the best known pop records of all time, Michael Jackson's Thriller. You know, but I grew up loving Motown funk and always listening to Tower of Power and like pushing all of my band directors in high school to specifically let us play funk because I just love sitting in that pocket, you know. I mean, that, that drum and bass collective, whenever you hear stuff like that, that's what really locks in and that's what gets, you know, everybody's bodies moving on the dance floor. It's like, yeah, I feel that beat. That beat's dropping. In my early days, the reasons I got started in drumming, uh, some of my big inspirations that got me started and like really on fire for it were um, Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, you know, Max Roach, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, you know, all the jazz cat classics. But then also stuff like, you know, Steve Gadd and um, Travis Barker. Uh, who else? There's, there's, there's always been so many good drummers out there. Um, I have to say the one song, if I could sum up one song that got me started in drumming, um, Two Princes, Spin Doctors. That song made me want to learn that intro fill in the worst way possible because I heard that. I'm like, that's like a combo of drum line and like that's got a groovy little like bounce to it. I need to learn that. So I literally locked myself in the basement for about four and a half months. This was before I had any lessons whatsoever. And I wasn't gonna stop until I learned the intro fill to that song. You know, so the first thing I taught myself to do on a drum set was a, du a proper double stroke roll, which as a like new beginning, like a, a fresh young drummer, that's the most difficult thing you could ever learn is a double stroke roll. You know, it took me four and a half months of me just, you know, listening on the radio and, you know, watching all these other drummers play, you know, like band room and stuff and just watching and paying attention. And then finally, you know, like learned how to double stroke roll. I'm like, I think I could do that fill now. And then came home one day and just bam, nailed it. And then immediately like thought I was going to have a heart attack because I was running around the house screaming like, yeah, I did it. This is awesome. Just so stoked. Just be passionate about what you do. You know, a, the common misconception with the amazing experiences that I got to have on tour internationally, you know, with all these sponsorships, with all these endorsements and huge names behind my drumming career, everyone immediately thinks, oh, well, it's all, you know, fame, lights, money, girls, booze, parties, and it's like, it's not. The only reason I got the experience um, and got the ability to do the things I do is because I legitimately respected everybody I was around at all times. You know, I kept my head down and worked my butt off for it, just like a lot of the artists in this hardworking city are doing. You know, this is this is a very small city, and it's not known as a music city or an art city. You know, it's starting to get it's starting to get that name, which is awesome. You know, that's a really really cool thing to see as a native of this city. We're getting a lot of transplants from other cities. You know, kids from Oregon, kids from New York, you know, kids from the South, and that's like a really cool thing that people want to be in the city. So that's just going to say that there's great things that are going to happen in the city and this city will be put on the map for the arts there's a lot of really really great things happening a lot of really cool creative minds you know like you and all the cats that touch faster doing really cool things and promotions and like show and like all the cool shows and like all the cool events you guys are hosting Drusky entertainments bringing in some great musicians um and people actually want to be in the city now you know people want to make sure they play pittsburgh on their tours you know, so so my advice for aspiring artists is literally just like work hard, be passionate about it. Don't focus on the money because if you're focusing on the money, you should have changed your job a long time ago. You know, the, the realism is there is no money in it. There isn't. I, for a very brief period of time, I was part of 0.0000001% that actually got paid pretty dang all right to play music for an, uh, an hour and a half a night and got paid to travel the world doing so, you know? But that was a very brief stint. That was a very a very small part of my life. You know, that was an amazing experience. Yeah, absolutely. I will never take that for granted. The reason I, I got to do those things is because I never for once took that for granted. I always appreciated where I was, you know, the, the opportunities that I had because I remember the humble beginnings of me, you know, sleeping in a van in a Walmart parking lot halfway across the country, living off of $5 a day for four years just to like stay, just to stay on the road, just because that's all we knew how to do. And that's what we loved. That's what we, me and my, like me and the bands I was with was passionate about. We just loved that feeling of getting on stage every night, whether it's to five kids or 5,000 and just, you know, being 
passionate about music, you know, just putting our all into it, you know, because it's one of those things where you really can't half-ass it, you know, because people can tell. People really can tell whenever it's like, oh, here's this musician that everyone says, oh, this guy thinks he's the stuff. And then you watch a performance or you go to the art gallery to see what they're doing and you think to yourself, I'm not really getting the passion that this artist put into it. You know, and that's, that's the, that's kind of like one of my, my biggest pet peeves is I, I remember how, how hard it was really being on the road for that long time. You know, I got kicked out of my house for a good couple of years because like my dad didn't agree with my lifestyle choice of, of being a touring musician. Like that, that was my aspiration. You know, and a lot of art, a lot of young artists, a lot of young musicians are dealing with that. You know, they want to try something different and go against the grain of what society or their parents or families expect them to do. And they get completely like disowned because of it. You know, that's following your passion. You know, you're going to have to deal with hardships to do the things you truly care about. You know, and it takes a lot of guts and a lot of balls to be able to do that. You know, so the people that do have the courage to do that kind of a thing, you know, they're making the right steps forward because if you really care about, this art, this community, you know, the music or your art galleries or the paintings or the photography or the videos, like any, whatever your medium is, you really have to be able to make those sacrifices to truly put your heart into it.